Okay, so this talk is called The Client is Not Always Right, and it originated because over over the years, as you know, Glue writes the, the Glue server, and our customers generally write the client software. And one of the challenges that we faced over the years is that we can write really good um, server software, but if the client software isn't just as good, the end result is, is not secure. So this talk is to, to hopefully give some pointers about um, some ways that you can write the client, some minimal things that you can do to make the clients more secure. So just to level set on the jargon, um, our industry has tons of jargon. So I'm gonna use these words for throughout the talk. So the user is, is the person or the subject and the user uses a browser or user agent, but I'm going to use browser. The client is the, is the software that the browser is using. So it it's, um, would be like the SP in, in, in SAML. And of course, the OP is, is the OpenID provider that the client is talking to. One of the uh, features of OpenID Connect is that it was designed to keep simple things simple, but make complex things possible. So depending on the transaction value, you, you can use OpenID Connect to mitigate varying levels of risk. This was a, a really helpful slide for in, that helped me understand the different levels. Um, it was given by, um, created by Nat Sakamura at, at Cloud Identity Summit last year. And you know, sort of at the bottom of the of the of the chart, we have OAuth without any OpenID Connect. And then, as we go up the chart, um, we add in the um, the ID token and the OpenID Connect implicit flow. We add the the code flow, and then we add the hybrid flow, which adds additional signing. So, um, not all of the OpenID Connect flows are are equally secure. In um, the code flow, we have client credentials. So the, the basic flow is is that the client um, sends a request, the user is redirected um, to be authenticated, the client gets back a code, and then the client presents that code plus its client credentials on the back channel to the OP and receives a token. Um, in the implicit flow, the client redirects a person to be authenticated, and the um, OP returns the uh, token to the client, but there's no client credentials here because the client is in the browser in the implicit flow, and there's no way to protect a, a client in the browser. So those are sort of the basics, and 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 so this first section is about just sort of like the, the most basic things you should do with your client. So one of the rules is don't send any access tokens as query parameters. There's all sorts of places where query parameters might be logged by the web server and um, they might show up in, in um, you know, traces um, of, the, of the network activity. So just in general, you don't want to send um, um, the access tokens in the query. Um, it, it, it might be um, one thing that people don't always think about is that in the response from the server might include the access token. So one of the um, profiles or one of the standards that OpenID Connect defines is the form post response mode uh, where the, the OP returns a form with a little bit of JavaScript that automatically submits and that prevents the um, the token from being put in the in the parameters. So if you if you're using the implicit flow uh, through a JavaScript client, uh, then if you don't use form post response mode, then you then the access token might show up in the browser history, which would make it susceptible to malware in the browser. So just in general, this is one of the sort of really most important rules. Is um, so client um, OpenID Connect supports a couple of different mechanisms for client authentication. So when the client is trading the code at the token endpoint for tokens, the a lot of um, 
OAuth implementations use um, client secret basic. Um, remember that the, that's, that uses the, um, the authorization header, but the, um, the, the client credentials are just encoded, not encrypted. So um, same thing with, with um, even post and client secret JWT. In these mechanisms, the client secret is actually not, not a, it might be encoded, but it's not encrypted. Um, client secret JWT adds signing. Um, the most secure method to use for client authentication is private key JWT. Um, that's, that's where, so the, the client holds the private key and registers the public key with the OP. And using this mechanism, um, it's really the most secure because the, the secret doesn't have to be shared with the OP. So one of the most basic things that you can do um, is to check the state value. In, in this is an OAuth vulnerability, not an OpenID Connect specific vulnerability. So it's really at a low level. Um, your application um, sets a random state and then posts that uh, when it posts a request to the OP. Um, the OP maintains that state and sends it back to the client. So the the client um, knows that if it sees a response. Um, that it should only even look at responses that it generated. So if an attacker is, um, knows the, re the redirect URI of a client, it could potentially spam that redirect URI. Um, so, that, so one of the basic security things you can do is make sure that this is a request that I sent. Um, so this check the state. Um, in, in the hybrid flow, there's also an S hash um, in the ID token. This is a hash of the state, um, which you can also use. Um, so one of the innovations of OpenID Connect is that you get back an ID token. And the ID token is really an identity assertion. It's more than a token, it's, it's an assertion. And like a SAML assertion, it gives you information about the authentication event, including who's the, who, what, is the OP that handled the authentication, the issuer. The audience is should be you, the client. That's the identifier for the client. Um, it includes the nonce, um, which is sort of like the state. Um, it allows you to, to verify you know, the nonce is sent in the authentication request and, and enables you to verify that this is a response to something that you sent. Um, the at hash is the... Um, this is the access token hash um, and the expiration and the subject identifier. So if you're writing a client, um, I have a couple of um, suggestions for what I think you should do. Um, verify the issuer, that's important. You wanna make sure that this is an ID token that you got back from the right OP. Verify the audience. Um, if, it's, if it's not your client ID, then you're, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't look at the, um, the ID token. Um, the nonce is also important um, to verify that this is the nonce that you actually uh, sent. And of course, the expiration. Um, and then also verify the signature. Um, the reason that the, you know, the OP signed it, went through the trouble of signing it. So you, part of the, um, the client developer's job is to verify the signature. So that's important. Um, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with JWT, um, JWT um, is in three parts. Um, there's the um, basically the signature um, algorithm, the payload, and the signature itself. Um, so, that, so you want to verify that the signature matches uh, the payload. So, there's some um, optional um, OpenID Connect um, features in the ID token. Um, the at hash, as I mentioned before, is um, it's a hash of the access token. If somehow an attacker could change the access token, you might think you're accessing your stuff, but you might be accessing somebody else's stuff. So the at hash adds some extra integrity over the access token. Um, S hash is for the state, and um, the the um, issued at. Um, so tells you um, how old this ID token is. Um, auth time tells you when did the person authenticate. Some OPs wait a really long time to authenticate. 
the the subject. So, or you might want to, if the person was authenticated weeks ago, you might say, well, that's not good enough for me. And you can signal to the OP that you want to reauthenticate the 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 user by sending an extra parameter prompt equals login. So these are some extra things you can do. Uh, OpenID Connect Working Group published implementers guides that I found that a lot of people either do, uh, developers either don't know about or don't read. But the basic implementer guide is for uh, server side applications, and the implicit gu gu client um, guide is for JavaScript applications. But it's worth They'll reiterate what I just mentioned, but they're worth um, taking a look at, and they're not too long. So these are some adva some more advanced things that you might want to think about. So OpenID Connect uh, um, supports this flow called hybrid flow. In, in OAuth, you have the code flow and the implicit flow. Um, in OpenID Connect, this, they have this new um, flow called hybrid flow. And the main response type. So if you're using, um, if you're using the code flow, your response type would just be code. If you're using the implicit flow, your um, response type would be token ID token. And if you're using the um, hybrid flow, it's always code plus something. And I think the most useful hybrid flow is code plus ID token. Um, so, and what that does is you get back the code, so you're still going to present the code at the token endpoint, but with the ID token, you can verify that this is the code that the server actually issued. If an attacker could somehow send you the wrong code, you might get back an access token for the wrong, um, for the wrong person. And so this adds a little bit of extra integrity um, over the code flow. And so sometimes when I, um, I notice that developers, they do response types, code, ID token, token. And I think they sort of think, well, I just want to get all of the possible, you know, responses. So, um, but I can't really think of a use case of why you would need code, token, and ID token. So if any of you can think of that use case, then, then let, send me an email or let me know because I can't think of what it is. So I would say use code ID token as a response type for hybrid flow. So the request object and the request object URI, um, there are times when the developer might want to make sure that the user doesn't tamper with the request sent to the OP. Uh, the OP. Uh, one example would be ACR values or prompt equals login, there could be times when you want to force these parameters. And anything that goes through the browser um, could just be modified by hand and, and literally typed into the, into the browser. Um, or potentially an attacker, the browser is more susceptible to malware and potentially um, the, um, the request could be tampered with. So one of the ways to mitigate this is to um, use a request object that's signed, or to use a request object URI. So in other words, generate the request object on a server that you control, and um, and then have the when the um, client sends the the authentication request, have it just send the URI where the where the OP can then just pick up what are the the request parameters. So it's it's a it's a good strategy. One of the challenges with the strategy is that it might require you to create an API to dynamically create request URIs because the state and the nonce needs to change. So where where a lot of the information in the request might be static, there are still some dynamic parts. So, uh, but these are these these are are good practices, and um, it's sort of extra credit. But there are some cases where it's really necessary. One of the um, recommendations, if you're supporting multiple OPs, is to use a different redirect um, URI for your application, one for each OP. And so um, this, this helps mitigate some attacks, and, and it's considered a, a, a good practice. Um, it doesn't apply if you're using one OP, but if you're supporting multiple OPs, 
it's a good idea. So I noticed that a lot of um, um, implementations don't use encryption. Um, encryption raises issues um, with with passing um, the JWTs because if you're using encryption, on, only the client that has the either the private key or the client secret um, can use that JWT. So if you're using signing, you can always pass it to to a backend application, but not not with encryption. Um, it does it does increase the security um, because the the OP knows that this um, can all you know can't be used even if HTTPS fails um, or that that this adds an extra extra layer of protection uh, protection and of course signing and encryption are are you know two different things so you can also encrypt the request object um, so I guess um, that would also that would be helpful if it's if you're sending the request object from the client, you wouldn't need that if you're doing request object URI. So PKCE is an OAuth um, RFC that is was developed for public clients because there are some cases where it's possible for the for let's say malware in the browser to intercept the code. And then use the use the code to um, ret retrieve the tokens, and so PKC adds an extra um, challenge that get red gets registered during the um, authentication request, so that you need that extra piece of information when you go and you collect the um, the tokens, and it's considered a good practice for both JavaScript and mobile apps. Uh, mobile apps. Um, can't really protect client secrets because they can be decompiled. So, um, so it's 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 considered necessary really for uh, for secure JavaScript or mobile applications. Uh, mutual TLS. So this is hard to implement, but it's um, it, it gives you protection um, from man-in-the-middle attacks. And so if your client can um, can it, so you need to set this up on the on the client application and the OP. It's a pain in the neck, um, it's, it's, but it's, it's possible um, and it helps. Um, it does definitely improve security. So another, another way to achieve what mutual TLS is, is, is um, achieving, but at um, sort of the um, application layer instead of at the infrastructure layer is to use um, token binding to TLS. So this is a, um, it's a new, it's a new, uh, I believe it's an RFC now. Um, it's, there's only, um, not, it's not terribly well supported by IOPs and, and uh, clients offer yet, but this is really coming as um, um, for, for secure applications or we see this as essential um, for preventing man in the middle attacks where a lot of the worst attacks um, have recently have been targeted man in the middle attacks um, using two even if the even if you're using two factor authentication um, if you're using OTP or SMS or mobile push notifications all of those are defeated by man in the middle attacks and that's basically where um, normally a phishing email gets a person to um, go to the a site that looks like their IDP but it's actually the the attacker um, they they put in their uh, their password. It gets sent to the uh, to the OP. Um, the OP then sends the out of band notification. The person enters it. So it's it's a very um, um, you know dangerous attack because the person you know, might not notice they're connected to the attacker. The certificate might be green. DNS might have been hacked. They might even be connecting to the right domain. So one of the ways to prevent this is that if you um, bind the ID token to the TLS channel, um, when the OP responds, you know, I'm using TLS channel two back to the client and the client says, oh, I'm using TLS channel one, it's a way to detect that, um, that there's a man in the middle. So it makes it more complicated to implement, but it um, has some good um, security um, properties. Some other things you can do 
to increase security is use the ACR values parameter to specify a certain authentication workflow. Um, you can also um, use default ACR values in the client registration metadata um, if you don't want to send it with every authentication request. And then you can validate in the ID token that that ACR that you were expecting was actually um, was actually what what happened at authentication time. And another recommendation I have is uh, put in a plug for FIDO U2F USB tokens, which because they're used through a browser plugin or the browser supports them natively, they also support man-in-the-middle attacks. So if you can get um, your users to adopt FIDO, the FIDO U2F USB. It, it's really helpful. These are some guidelines. I'll, I'll put them. Um, I'll put them. The slides will be available afterwards. Um, but um, of course, the the client secrets need, need to be non-guessable. So there's a minimum amount of, of entropy required. There's minimum key values that are now recommended, and um, also. Um, signature algorithms, so you can check those later. So, okay, so after, this is sort of extra credit, but um, one of the important things to know is what if you're validating the keys, but you're using the attacker's keys, not the keys of the OP? So one of the ways this risk is, is mitigated is by providing a different distribution mechanism for um, for the keys. So there's a new standard called OpenID Connect Federation, which um, enables, um, let's say, an out-of-band me uh, distribution mechanism for signing keys. So if you have the signing keys of the OP ahead of time, you can validate um, that the um, JWKS keys were correct. Um, in this uh, spec, um, in addition to your JWKS um, URI for the um, the keys, and those get rotated frequently, like every two days. You have the signed JWKS URI, and it enables the client to verify that the keys that they're using are actually the right keys in case something like the HTTPS certificate or the root CA got hacked. There's a couple of um, ways that you might think you're using the OP keys, but, but you're not. Um, so... Um, I guess I think this is one of my last slides, but software statements. Um, how does the client register? Um, this is another security precaution you can take. Um, if you're allowing dynamic client registration software statements, you can think of it as like a token that allows client registration. And, and you can also um, specify um, what scopes and claims are, are um, allowed for this client. So it's a way to sort of pre-enable trust for the client if the client's going to be dynamically um, registering. Um, I wanted to mention some clients that we really like. Um, I always try and guide people to use client software that's out there. Don't write your own client software if possible. Um, so the, the mod auth OpenIDC client, the Apache filter, is is one is probably one of the best clients out there. We we if you want to use an implicit client, um, this um, client um, OpenID Connect client we like a lot. This is probably the best OpenID Connect client. Um, so um, Glue, I'll put this is a little plug for Glue, but we have um, this middleware called OxD, which um, it it helps you. Um, implement some of the security without um, the developers having to know about it. So it handles, it does some of the heavy lifting in the back end. It's a service that runs on the computer. We also have a network version of Oxty coming out. So um, if developers want the simplicity, but they don't want to validate the, the, the um, signature or use the hybrid flow, they can use the middleware. And then AppAuth, um, which is the Google mobile software, and there's actually an AppAuth JavaScript that, that's out there now too. Um, the, this was um, donated to the OpenID Foundation by Google, and that's our only recommended um, mobile um, software right now. So, um, so that that's about it. Um, um, be happy to open it up for questions now.
I see one question on the list. Once the JWT has been issued by the OP, do you recommend using it to authenticate each subsequent request or exchanging it for a session ID like a cookie and using that to authenticate requests? Um, so we get a lot of questions about JWT and its relationship to um, especially how do you pass, um, let's say if you're calling a backend API, how do you pass um, the subject to the backend API? Um, my personal recommendation is to pass the access token, not the, um, not the user info JWT or ID token. Um, those are signed, however, the audience is restricted to the client. So, um, so also the access token is short-lived, uh, whereas the ID token or, or JWT is just a JSON object that, that could be read. You can't use encryption if you're passing the, um, um, the ID token or the user info. So you're really passing the, this JWT in the clear with the signature attached. So I think the access token as was really designed to be passed and it's short-lived. So I think it's the, that's your best um, bet. Um, you know, regarding cookies, like remember that the session is in the browser. Um, the access token is, is used by the client to find out who the person is. The, the cookie is in the browser, and so the cookie means that when you go when you go to another application, um, the OP can say, "Oh, I know this person. Um, I've already authenticated them. No need to prompt them for authentication again, and then just automatically issue the um, um, the code to the um, um, to the web application." So don't confuse the session, which is the connection of the OP to the person's browser and the tokens which are used by the client applications um, to, um, to identify the person. Um, any more questions? Let me... Um, Okay, um, well, I'll, um, we're going to send out a, a follow-up email, and I'll put the, um, the slides um, in the email. And I recorded this webinar, and we'll put a link to the, the recording also. So I just want to say thanks a lot, everybody, for joining. Um, if anyone's um, up for visiting um, Chicago uh, next week, uh, Cloud Identity Summit should be really interesting. And if you need any more information about Glue or the Glue server, of, of course, um, feel free to book a meeting or, or send me an email. Okay. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you.